I've hinted at my disdain for Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales before, so how would I improve this succubus of a movie? There are no redeeming qualities here. Not even the idea is good, but the execution is bad. Instead of me using the same plot with changes in the details like I did in previous Pirates movies, I'll have to dismantle everything about this and come up with a brand new story. Every story has characters who want something, and they encounter conflict in their mission to get what they want. This movie has five characters who fit that bill. Henry Turner wants to find the trident of Poseidon to free his father from mystical servitude. Captain Salazar wants Jack Sparrow dead, as well as all other pirates. Karina Smith wants to find the trident because it's her only connection to her father. Jack Sparrow wants to drink sex and thieve his way through the movie, and because Salazar wants him dead, Henry convinces him to help find the trident, which will make the undead Salazar less of a threat. Captain Barbosa lost some of his ships to Salazar, so a witch convinces him to lead Salazar to Jack before Jack can find the trident. Not sure why, as it would be more prudent for Barbosa to find Jack and help him find the trident since they share a common enemy. Since this wouldn't be a Pirates of the Caribbean movie without some double crossery, Barbosa eventually agrees with me and joins forces with Jack, Henry, and Karina only after leading Salazar to them. Henry Turner wants to free his father, except it's been 10 years since the audience saw Will Turner. We don't care about him anymore. Karina wants to follow the map in her father's diary, but I'm not sure why. There is a 1 in 700 million chance of her meeting her father on this quest, and that's if he's still alive. I'm not sure what her end game is. Do you think you'll feel a closer bond with a man who abandoned you if you follow this map? Why do you believe in the trident of Poseidon, but you don't believe in ghosts and goblins? If this diary belonged to Barbosa, and he was as familiar with astronomy as he claimed, why didn't he find the trident circa Curse of the Black Pearl and break his skeleton curse? Salazar is another villain with connections to Jack's past, after one, two, three, four other villains with connections to Jack's past. His motivation is getting rid of all pirates. You could kill every pirate on the planet, and there would still be more tomorrow. Theft is never going to go away. Salazar's father and grandfather were killed by pirates, fueling his mission to get rid of them. Noble, but why are you killing British sailors? They're not pirates. Why send Henry to deliver a message to Jack? Again, a 1 in 700 million coincidence, you would find the one person who has been looking for Jack for 9 years to send a message. And you're trapped in the Devil's Triangle. What good will it do to send a message until Jack is stupid enough to betray the compass which will release you? What if Jack kept the compass? You would still be trapped in the Devil's Triangle, and Henry delivering a message would be a waste of time. Would you have sent this old man to send the message if you knew Henry was searching for Jack for 9 years and had no luck finding him? Speaking of Jack, he feels tired in this movie, and I can't tell how much of this is Johnny Depp phoning it in, and how much was the script making him a fool. What was fun about Curse of the Black Pearl was this guy looked like an idiot, but was able to outsmart everyone. Seeing him succeed against all odds endears us to him. This Jack Sparrow actually is a moron. When we first see him, he's so drunk he doesn't realize he's in the middle of a robbery. Seeing the wanted poster that says he's only wanted for one pound is heartbreaking after he's been able to persevere in previous movies. This movie not being able to decide if it wants to play this as pathos or comedy also hurts. Having Jack be at his lowest point and triumphing at the end could have worked, but you've got four other characters you're juggling, three of whom we've never seen before. I'd say juggling so many characters is difficult, and that's why it takes 50 minutes for our three main characters to join forces, and another half hour for Barbosa to join them. Except Curse of the Black Pearl was introducing even more characters, and Will and Jack joined forces around the 40 minute mark, after clearly setting up what was at stake. Elizabeth's been kidnapped by cutthroats who knows what they'll do to her once they restore their flesh. I don't know what happens if these clowns don't find the trident. Karina has nothing at stake here. Henry wants to free his father, but what then? Who will ferry the souls? If it's so easy to break the curse so nobody is the captain of the Flying Dutchman, why was anyone ever ferrying souls? Was this job ever important? And why is Will covered in barnacles? I thought Davy Jones and his crew were fishy because they neglected their duty. When we saw Will in the stinger for At World's End, he wasn't fishy. If Jack getting rid of the compass releases Salazar, why didn't Salazar come after Jack when he gave Elizabeth the compass in two? Does the compass know when it's just being borrowed and when it's being traded for rum? We're told betraying the compass will release your greatest fear. So Jack's greatest fear is a guy we've never heard of for four movies? When Henry tells Jack Salazar is coming, Jack seems certain Salazar is dead. So why would he fear Salazar? Also, didn't you get this from Tia Dalma? Brandon Sanderson said, an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. I don't understand anything in this movie. This trident is a magic artifact. How does a magic artifact that destroys all the curses of the sea work? What is the cost of such a monumental purchase? Does the trident even work? How are Davy 
Jones and his crew back to being fish people? How is Davy Jones even alive? Who cares about the retconning of the compass again? Or Henry's quest only raising more questions than it answers? As long as we're all having fun, right? Well, I'm not having fun. This movie is giving me a headache as I try to figure out the basics. Even the worst installments of this franchise got that right. They explicitly tell us the rules of the skeleton men and the coins. Davy Jones cannot go on land. If you stab the heart, you become the new captain. Even when I disliked what I was watching, I understood what I was watching. But this movie can't figure out the new stuff here, and it messes up stuff from the previous movies. And since this movie is trading on nostalgia for those movies, it would probably be a good idea to get some of this right. In my version of At World's End, Norrington becomes the captain of the Flying Dutchman. No need for Henry Turner to go on this adventure. Instead of Salazar, we will use real-life pirate Anne Bonny, active in the 1720s and much more interesting than these characters. Her husband became an informant on pirate activity in the Bahamas, getting many pirates killed, and while she was sentenced to hang, there are no records of her release or execution. She escaped and got trapped behind a magic barrier with big monsters that has nothing to do with Jack's compass. She never met Jack. Every character does not have to be connected to Jack for him to get involved in the story. This barrier weakens every 30 years or so, allowing Anne to return. She got a magic book that she will use to control the barrier and use it against the assembled enemies of her fellow pirates. She wants to prove she is nothing like her coward husband, and she wants to use this mystical prison to give pirates the upper hand. Some of the more level-headed pirates are afraid this will get out of control. Opening and closing the barrier might permanently open that can of worms, and the beasties on the other side she spent a few decades fighting will get out and humanity will be doomed. We've seen the Kraken before, but that was one monster directed by a human intelligence. This would be hundreds of similar entities, with free reign to destroy humanity. Bonnie's broached this idea to the Brethren Court, who I don't want to be too active in this story, but we can mention them. Pirate hierarchy is kind of fun, I guess. Jack is in prison at the start of the movie, feeling morose. Jack's getting old, and I'm getting older too. And if the point of 2 and 3 was that the good old days of piracy are coming to a close, that's gotta be true now. Maybe Jack watched Mr. Gibbs die, and is having second thoughts about doing this for the rest of his life. This wouldn't be played for comedy. You can have a fun adventure film without the main character becoming a clown. Karina will provide our lighthearted elements of the movie. She's excited to meet someone she spent her life hearing stories about. Not to encourage the rape, theft, and murder pirates are typically known for, she likes Jack because of the independence from the rigidity of society that he represents. She doesn't want to get married and hang on the elbow of some dude she doesn't like. She likes the sea, and sticking it to the man is her only way of following her dreams. Despite himself, Karina's energy will rub off on Jack. She was sent by Barbosa and Angelica because they think he might be able to help them stop Anne from unleashing these monsters on humanity. Why do they need Jack? Barbosa used to be a pirate lord, but since he betrayed them years ago, they won't listen to him, but they might listen to the infamous Jack Sparrow. Why is Barbosa here if he was still a privateer at the end of my version of On Stranger Tides? End of the world, enemy of my enemy is my friend. To parallel Jack's despondency, Barbosa is feeling similar. What will the world do with him if they stomp out piracy in his lifetime? They already give him the stink eye and whisper pirate behind his back, so is he any better in the eyes of polite society than the pirates he hunts? Our characters figure out the book is the key to defeating Anne. If they can destroy it, problem solved. The barrier will thicken back up for another 30 years. There's some skullduggery, a little buccaneering, some buckling of swashes, and they realize this book is magic. We can't just burn it. Anne and her allies realize these monsters won't listen to her just because she cut their leash, so it's mass chaos. Jack gets an idea. He manages to steal the book and use it to go through the barrier, taking the book with him. If nobody else can get access to the other side once the walls thicken up, humanity is safe. Barbosa covers Jack and gets killed, giving Jack the extra time he needs to get the book. Anne and her allies get killed by monsters. Angelica and her allies kill the monsters. This allows you to continue the franchise with characters like Angelica or Karina, if you wish, since there were reports of a lady-led pirates film as far back as 2018. So you could get a jump start on that with these characters. This was not a high point of Johnny Depp's career, so I'm not sure why this movie ended with him ready to sail off on another adventure. Give him something of a happy ending, a respite from the world that doesn't want or need him anymore. Adventures fighting monsters, which he has experience doing. Hopefully, your audience will be satisfied with Jack and Barbosa's send-offs, while also getting excited about adventures with newer characters. Hopefully. This wasn't super detailed, but hopefully it gave you an idea of what I think would have been an improvement. I hope you liked this one, and if you did, I'll be back next week to talk about something else. Until then, have a good one.